Good morning. How we doing? Ah, good. Woo! Okay. Turn me up. Yeah, turn me up. Turn me up. Come on, come on. I haven't even heard the message yet. Uh, we'll, we'll see if you're clapping by the end. Um. <laughs> What'd you say? Okay, thank you. Riota's with me at least. Appreciate you, my brother. <laughs> uh, man, how about that worship this morning? That was amazing. Man, I, I, I love the songs where it's just like talking about Jesus, really hitting at the core of the gospel. That is powerful. It was awesome. Um, yeah, so my name's Dylan Walls. For any of you who don't know me, I'm on staff with Call to Greatness, our, our campus ministry here at the church. And um, I got a question to start us off this morning. So how many of you guys are on social media pretty frequently? By show of hands. Pretty much everybody. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of us are. How many of you guys have been seeing those AI-generated videos that have been going around now? Anybody see some of those? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I know I see them uh, pretty, pretty often. And, you know, a lot of the times you can tell they're, they're pretty fake. Like, they're not super advanced. It's like something you'd see in a dream almost. It's like... You know, just this bizarre kind of video of this, like, amazing mountain vista, but it's just way too bizarre. Um, and for any of you who don't know what AI technology is, if you haven't heard about that, it's basically this, this thing that enables computers to learn, read, write, create, analyze. Some of you may have heard of ChatGPT. Anyone ever been on ChatGPT before? Uh, I've been on there a couple of times, cannot lie. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was I was curious to know just how much it's capable of. So last night I actually went in there and and, and typed and put in uh, write me a, a 20 page essay on the American Revolution, and you probably have to pay for the premium subscription I'm guessing to get something like that because it didn't crank out that. But in like the matter of three seconds, like boom, this six point in depth outline was just right in front of me. I was like, dang, okay, that's that's cool. Um, one time we, we actually used uh, chat GPT for CTG. We were coming up with an event for students and um, we were doing a Thanksgiving event and wanted to come up with a creative name and same kind of thing. It just cranked out all these names just in the blink of an eye and uh, it, it was crazy. And, and some people were, I think, are kind of freaking out about AI because um, you know, before we know it, it seems like if as it advances, you know, it, it's going to come to a time where it might be hard to tell whether things are, are real or fake online. And there's actually this picture I found, too. Uh, there, there was a study that someone did from the New York Times. And so they had these people in this study look at all these different pictures of people. And as you can see on the top there are top photos identified as real in this study. And most of them were AI-generated photos. Yeah. And then the bottom, the other way around, People identified these as AI photos in the study, and most of them were real. That's crazy. So it, it kind of shows just like AI is, 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 is capable of some things. And we're entering this age of where, you know, it's going to be, you know, maybe more and more difficult to really distinguish what is real and, and, and fake. And the level of skepticism around things might be uh, increasing. And I, don't, I know that's not a good thing for me because I'm already a pretty skeptical person sometimes. But I know uh, when I'm on social media, uh, another thing I feel s skeptical about at times is when I see famous people who, who say they're Christians. Anybody else ever been there? Yeah. I, I, like, I know um, Kanye West, a few years ago, he started dropping some, some Christian music albums, and everybody's like, yeah, Kanye's with us now. Like, let's go. And and I was like, you know, the, the music's pretty fire, but, I mean, is this guy really a Christian, you know? And, and uh, I, I can't lie, even, even when I see people like Tim Tebow, and I know a couple people might have some choice words for me after this for even questioning, like, how dare you, <laughs> like, Tim Tebow? No, but, um, like, we don't know him, you know? I mean, he seems like a great guy. I'm sure he's, he's probably, uh, you know, a solid Christian, but, you know, how, how can we really know? And I think for me, Maybe part of the reason why I get a little skeptical about uh, some Christian people is because there was this other guy that I used to listen to uh, sometimes. His name was Ravi Zacharias. Have any of you guys heard of him? 
Yeah. Um, he was a world-renowned speaker and apologist who I, I watched when I was younger. I, I had a, a lot of questions about my faith and, and just truth and stuff like that when I was younger. So I really got into apologetics and loved the way that this guy would articulate just why having a biblical worldview is really the best way to go and, and stuff like that. And eventually he he passed away and he, you know, he seemed like someone who was really solid in their faith, right? This guy's running a huge ministry. He was traveling the world, inspiring millions of people. And unfortunately, after not too long after he passed away, tons of allegations started coming out against him of sexual misconduct with hundreds of women. And what was even worse was after those allegations started to pile up, his own organization actually came out, came out and confirmed all of it was true. And man, as someone who was like 20 at that time, that was brutal for me to hear because, you know, I was young in my faith. Like I said, it, you want people to look to, look up to for truth and, and, and you want to see people who actually live it out and, and, and show that it's true, right? And so for me, that was a really eye-opening experience because I realized like it, it doesn't matter how many incredible things you do for God or how well you present yourself as a Christian. Just like John talked about last week, just doing the right things in themselves is like putting makeup on a dead body, right? It doesn't change the fact that that person is still dead, right? And in order for us to really experience lasting change, it takes the Spirit of God to give us new life from the inside out. And so we're continuing on our series in, in Hebrews right now and um, talking about how we can level up in our faith. And, and the point of my examples isn't so that we can get better at discerning whether every person is a real Christian or not, but I think it, it raises an, an important question for ourselves, which is, man, how do I know if my own faith is real? Right? What, what should my life look like when I've really been changed by God? What should the appropriate responses be when you've gone from death into new life? And so that's, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And we're going to jump into Hebrews 12. I, I got the passages up on the screen. But if you want to flip to Hebrews 12, we're going to start right from the beginning. And we'll start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. So I think it's helpful to understand the backstory of who this was being written to. This book was written to a, gr a group of Jewish Christians at the time during the early church. Um, they, they grew up in a society that was predominantly Jewish, and because of that, the, these people were experiencing really intense persecution. They were being publicly shamed and humiliated for being Christians. They were losing their sources of income because people would just completely stop doing business with them. Some of them were even being robbed and thrown in prison. I mean, it was, it was getting rough for these guys. I mean, I don't, most, we don't experience that kind of thing nowadays. I mean, this was, this was bad. And and so because of that, as you can imagine, some of these followers were abandoning their faith altogether. Like, man, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to go back to Judaism, I guess, and, and wait for the other next Messiah or something. I don't know. But so the author starts out by telling them in this passage, hey, don't be people who give up just because the going is actually starting to get tough. Like, your, your faith has to cost you something. And in the previous chapter, he's He's going through the, the hall of faith, right? He's telling them, don't forget about every great person that you have looked up to in your faith. All those people had to suffer and wait on God's promise for years and were persecuted just like you and were beaten and even killed for their faith. 
Like, and, and don't forget the, the whole foundation of your faith is Jesus, right? He's the one leading the way in this race. He suffered more than anyone and laid down his life completely. And then he goes on and gives them this real nice encouraging word at the end. And he says, hey, I know you guys are having a hard time, but the fact is you haven't even shed blood yet. Like, this has been worse for others, and, and this could be worse for you too. You know, I'm, I'm sure that felt great <laughs> to read that. And really, this leads into, I think, the first truth for us this morning, which is that if your faith is real, it is going to cost you something. If your faith is real, it's going to cost you something. And one, one person who I think has illustrated this in an amazing way in recent years, he's someone who, who I've been learning about over the last year, is a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's an incre uh, incredible person. I'm sure hopefully some of you have heard of him. I know Andrew Mullen is probably crawling in his seat right now because I'm mispronouncing his name, but I'm just I'm doing the American pr pronunciation, so forgive me, Andrew. But Dietrich was a, a guy who lived in Germany during the Nazis, the rise of the Nazis in the 30s and 40s, right? And when he was young, he was a brilliant guy. He had potential to do just about anything. And um, what he ended up choosing to do was to study theology. And so uh, he ended up going on to be an incredible theologian, author, pastor. He was a church leader across Europe. And as the 30s began and Hitler and the Nazis started to crack down on the Jews and really do some shady stuff, Bonhoeffer was one of the greatest influencers in leading the charge, standing up against uh, the Nazis and Hitler. And they, they actually separated from the German uh, the German state church because they would just bow down to whatever Hitler would tell them to do and he was helping Germans actually live out their faith and and fight for truth and one of the things that I find most inspiring that he did in the 30s was um, everyone who was a prominent figure in Germany uh, as like right before World War II started they were all leaving the country all of the people in the theological and intellectual circles, people like Albert Einstein and all these other amazing scientists, they were leaving Germany, right? And while everyone else was leaving, Bonhoeffer was actually in America at the time, and uh, all his friends were telling him, like, hey, man, just stay here, like, do what everyone else is doing, like, you can find political asylum here, you're going to be safe, and... And especially for him, they're like, dude, if you go back to Germany, especially, you're going to get rounded up because you speak out against Hitler way too much. And Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer's response to them was this. It was amazing. He said, how can I help rebuild my country if I don't share in its trials? Amazing. And so Bonhoeffer, he went back and continued to do exactly what he was doing. He was standing up against Hitler and the Nazis throughout. And after he... Uh, eventually uh, collaborated uh, with a failed assassination attempt on Hitler. He ended up in prison. And what was amazing was it just goes to show more of the kind of person that he was. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, he actually continued to do what he was always doing. In prison, he pastored and encouraged and led his prisoners in Bible readings and prayer. And he actually made so much of an impact that if Nazi prison guards had a prisoner that was really down and out, they would go to Bonhoeffer and have him go into their cell and minister to them. And so one day, one day after Bonhoeffer had been in prison after a, a couple of years, he was leading a small service for the prisoners he was with. And Bonhoeffer was reading the verses of the day. Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. And 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And there was one man who gave an eyewitness account of his sermon and described it this way. He said, Bonhoeffer spoke to us in a manner which reached the hearts of all of us, finding just the right words to express the spirit of imprisonment and the thoughts and resolution, resolutions which it had brought. And almost immediately after Bonhoeffer finished the sermon, two guards came in and told him, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, please come with us. And everyone knew what that meant. And so all of his, his friends in prison bade him goodbye. And that same man 
who gave an eyewitness account, said this. He said, while we were all saying our goodbyes, Bonhoeffer drew me aside and said, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. And on April 9th, 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer died as a proud advocate of the kingdom of God. He knew that if his faith was real, it was going to cost him something. And man, that's the heart of the gospel, is that we're dead in our sin, right? We're lost sheep in need of a shepherd, and we can't figure out the right way to live on our own. Right? We try everything we do to live a safe life, just like everyone was telling Bonhoeffer to do, and we look for purpose and truth in all the wrong places. But man, if we want to have real faith, we have to give up our own way of looking at the world and trust God with all of it. And just like we saw with Bonhoeffer, man, it wasn't just blind trust in someone he wasn't sure about. Man, he knew fully well that every time he put his life on the line in obedience to God, that on the other side of that risk would come life. And so, for us, what does our faith cost us? What have we given up so we can run the race God has for us? Do you, do you come to church and really consider the messages that you hear? Or do you come for the hangs and the friends and the good vibes and, and the music? Man, do you really come because you desperately need God in your life? Is Jesus really Lord? If Jesus looked at your family right now, would he say, yeah, that's what a godly marriage looks like. That's what a godly parent looks like. If he looked at your dating relationship, would he say, man, that's what it looks like to honor me before marriage or if he looked at you would he say man this is a disciple right here this person stays true to their word they have people in their life that really know them you know they're being discipled they're not just coming to church as a consumer right they're here to worship God first and then serve others they're giving their money they're sacrificing their time they're using their gifts to help other people right they're making disciples would God say that about you how real is your faith? And like John said last week, it's not, it's not just about doing more for God. That only gets you so far, but have you been changed by God in such a way that you can't help but obey the Lord in everything that you do? I love this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer where he said that faith is only real when there is obedience never without it and faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience we feeling good <laughs> all right we're going to keep it rolling here we go verse 12 so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. And make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright as the firstborn, firstborn son for a single meal. So after he's telling these Christians, right, that, man, it's going to take some sacrifice, the, the author basically goes on and he says, do what you need to do to get strong because you guys are not going to be able to run this race without other people, right? He talks about helping the weak become strong, living a holy life because people can only, ha that people can only live holy if they have someone to look up to. Look out for roots of bitterness. All these verses, in a nutshell, I think are telling us that real faith focuses on the faith of others. I, I've been a person who loves sports my whole life. I, I really love playing and watching soccer, basketball, gol golf. Those are my top three right now. So if you want to be my friend, um, you know, we'll, we'll do some of those things quite a bit. 
And uh, in interesting, over the last years, you, I, this might be a shocker to some of you guys, but I've noticed that growing in my faith has actually trickled into other parts of my life, like the way I play sports. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And um, so when, when I was younger, I, I came to, to Washburn to play basketball here. I was on the JV team for a couple years, but never really had success. I, I uh, didn't really actually play at all. And the reason why was even though I was super driven, right, I had dreams to be a great player, and I had a pretty good work ethic too, I thought the way I would be successful is if I just, like, stayed locked in on myself, right, and made sure that I was doing all that I can for my own personal improvement and, and do, my, do whatever I can to work my way up the roster, right? And so I would always be locked in. I wouldn't really communicate with other people. And so when we would be in a practice or a scrimmage and our team would start playing poorly, I would usually get mad at my teammates. I'd be so focused on why it's everyone else's fault, right? And I'd be mad that I'm looking bad because of them. And then I'd just try to take over and put my team on my back. And I'm not LeBron James, obviously, so that didn't really work out too well. Um, so a lot of times I was pretty down on myself. And, uh, and my, as you can tell, my, my career did not pan out very well because of that. And so what I've realized now is when I play basketball and soccer is that, man, if I actually focus more on helping other people get better, if I focus on how I can encourage other people to make good plays and actually give constructive input to people rather than just getting PO'd at them and never saying anything, like, it's wild. It's, it's, it's amazing. But like people actually play way better when you do that thing. It's amazing. And I play better too. And sports are actually way more, way more fun and fulfilling than they've ever been for me. And so, man, what I've, what I've learned is that we can only play at our best when the people on our team are playing at their best too. And in the same way, man, that a real teammate should focus on the success of his teammates because that's what brings out the team's highest potential, man, our faith should be focused on the faith of other people, Right? Because the reality is, the reality is, is that we're not just playing in a game either. Like, we're living in a war. We're living in a spiritual war. Every day there is a battle going on between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And he wants nothing more than to, to keep you distracted and deceived, focused on just dumb stuff. And so, man, community is, is important because it unlocks our gifts and, and, you know, it's a great way to make friends and we can discover our blind spots. All that stuff's great, and that's true. But man, there are spiritual forces at work in the world that are working tirelessly to swallow us up every day by lies and the ideologies that are going on in this world, right? Because any place where there's not the kingdom culture going on, there is another culture going on that is not from God, and it's causing death and destruction. And so, man, we need each other to keep us in accordance with the truth. Satan loves he loves, man, when you think you're fine where you're at and, he, and when you think other people are good too. He loves when a root of bitterness can, can kind of slowly just creep its way into a relationship with someone and keep you divided with that person for months or even years. He loves when people isolate and run from authentic community and, and run after the simple things in life. He loves when people come to church but withhold certain parts of their lives from other people. But like the author said, and like I learned, we can only combat that by not just avoiding sin, but what's beautiful, beautiful is we can take the offensive, right? So we learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. We help others get strong. We learn to love what God loves and hate what he hates. That's what holiness really means. And we call sin out in our communities and call people up to something higher. And so, man, I promise you, when you start to live in that kind of community, you will never want to go back. So we got to be people who focus on the faith of others. All right, we'll, we'll move on in verse 25. It says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger... We will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. 
This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. So, third point this morning is that real faith will not be shaken. Real faith will not be shaken. Uh, there's a guy that's a f- friends with a lot of us in our uh, CTG and church network. His name is Greg Tipton. He says that every one of us has a storm coming. Every one of us has a storm coming. And when that storm comes, will you be able to withstand it? And this last point is something that God has been showing me more than anything else over the last six years of my life because about six years ago when I was just a couple years into college I started experiencing chronic uh, anxiety and and it was intense I became just an emotional wreck out of nowhere and I remember having a hard time just being able to do a simple job that summer at back home and was having a hard time just even being present with people and honestly the, the best way I can describe it was if, if you can imagine maybe a moment where you've had some of your worst anxiety, maybe you're in a car crash or you're watching a scary movie or something or just something really stressful like that, that was basically what I was feeling most of the time on a daily basis that whole summer. I mean, it was, it was awful and by far the worst time of my life. And near the end of the summer, as school was approaching, my parents were concerned for me, so I started taking a medication to just keep me going through school and all of that. And eventually I got off of it because I was just numb and and I hated being on medication. So I started weaning myself off at the beginning of 2020 and was really believing, man, really believing that all of this was going to be behind me, that that God was going to bring me into better health. And I was like, man, surely after two years of this, like, God, you have something better in store for me. And so I, I got fully off my medication and I was off them for about a month. And all of a sudden, a month in, I started having chronic pain in my gut now. And then not long after all that, my anxiety and my emotional pain started coming back up. And I was like, bro, God, what the heck is this? <laughs> like, like, I thought I had my Job season, you know, for a couple years. Like, you know, I, I, I thought I learned everything I needed to. And, you know, like, this was not supposed to be happening. And part of me was like, man, God, what did I do to, des- to deserve this? Like, what, did, what am I missing? Um, and so quickly after that started up again, I did everything I possibly could to figure out what the heck was going on. And so I was seeing countless doctors. I had all these tests done, got all the scans, all the blood work right. I'm probably one of the few people who can say they got a colonoscopy done in their 20s. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's cool. But, I mean, I was trying everything. I was desperate, man, okay? Desperate times call for desperate measures. <laughs> and so... <laughs> after a few years of that, but th- thankfully, that was the worst thing I did, okay? I didn't go any farther than that, you know? Um, <laughs> so after a few, a few years of that and a ton of praying, right, I think God has finally helped me figure out what's going, been going on. So through the help of another doctor I met last year, uh, we believe that I have this thing called chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Wow, never heard of it. And uh, it's basically this autoimmune issue where my whole body is actually experiencing chronic inflammation because apparently I'm sensitive to toxins in the air. And so I had inflammation going on in my brain that was causing all the anxiety and the the emotional issues. And obviously that's what's kind of caused the digestive stuff too. And so it seems like for the last six years, that's what's been throwing my whole body out of whack. And, And the reason why I share this is because through all of this, I believe God has really shown me something important, which is that, man, God puts us through some things so we can really know some things. Because (laughs) I have realized that it is one thing to know some things about God, and it is a whole other thing to really believe it. Right? We sing all the time how God is good, and God is my peace, and God is my strength, and God is my provider, you know. But do we really experience that, right? Uh, Going back a little bit, when I was a a senior in college a few years ago, 
I, I still had real, I still had yet to really figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and I wasn't passionate about anything. I had a good internship at a business, so I was like, you know, I'll, I'll just probably try to get a full-time job there, but thankfully, I was in CTG at the time, and as you can imagine with my history, I was really wanting to know God more and, and get some help, and so I started to realize that, man, if my faith was real, it was going to have to cost me something, and that it needed to be focused on others. And so I started developing this passion to see the kingdom of God advance. And, and God started, uh, started to nudge me towards, towards ministry. And back then, I was, man, I was in the thick of my health struggle. Like, I'm, I'm doing pretty better now. You know, some of you guys know that I, I'm on the carnivore diet, and that kind of helps me manage my symptoms and stuff like that. But back then, I was in it. I had no idea what was going on, and I was suffering daily. Um, and so when God started bringing ministry up, I was like, God, it, ministry is hard enough for healthy people. Like, there's no way I'm doing this. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, you know, I was struggling with a lot of insecurity at the time, too, of course. And I was thinking, like, God, I'm not a great communicator. You know, I'm not much of a leader. I'm not even a people person. Like, I don't like most people. Um, you know, I, if, if, I, <laughs> if I do this, I'm going to suck at it, honestly. Like, I don't think you want me. But, man, I'll, I'll never forget when I finally had to make the decision. It was a couple months before I was about to graduate, and it was now or never. It was like, we got to go, bro. And one afternoon, I finally sat down to pray, and I felt like God said something to me that was one of the clearest things I had ever heard from him. He said, Dylan, if you don't do this, you are going to look back on your life a few, few years from now and utterly regret not taking this opportunity. And that was not an easy thing to hear. I really felt like, man, if I didn't do this, I'd be running from God. And, and I felt like, if, how can I say I really have faith in God if I don't at least trust him with this for a season? You know? And so I went for it. And I really wish I could tell you that I had some faith and was, and was excited to do this. But honestly, I was pretty scared at the time. Like, <laughs> I wasn't sure if God was really going to come through for me. Like, I, I realize now that I did not know God much at all back then. Um, and let me tell you, it has not been fun in games. Like, it's been brutal at times. There have been times where I've wanted to back out, and I've really had to wrestle with insecurity and fear and embarrassment and my pride and ego and anger and all of that. But, man, I can tell you now that what God told me back then was so true. And I know God now to a level that would have never been possible had I not taken a step to trust him. Right? There were things in, I used to believe in my head that I used to say that I believed, but I had no idea if that, was stu that stuff was true. And now I can tell you without a doubt and with absolute certainty because I have experienced it in my own life that God is real. God will come through for you. God really is your strength and your peace. God truly is a firm foundation, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And man, if you want to have real faith, we have to understand that God wants to put us through some things. I wish it could be differently, but it just isn't. And, and it's not because he likes to see us suffer or wants to make life harder for no reason. But God wants us to know some things that we can only really know if we experience it. And so we experience it through being shaken, right? We, it's through having to go through some hard things. And so the question for us is, how much are we embracing the storm that God has, has in your life right now? Are we trusting God so that, man, when all of this is said and done, that we can stand and be a part of those who are unshaken? What are the problems that are going on in your life right now? And how have you been viewing that? Have you been doing everything you can to avoid it and praying for God to take it away and cursing it? Or have you considered that this could actually be an opportunity and a blessing from God? 
right? That he's wanting to help you to level up so that you can have a greater level of confidence. He can give you an experience that no one can take away from you and a witness to the power and love of God that could change countless lives. How are you viewing the hard things in your life right now? God is calling us to have real faith. There's no halfway faith, unfortunately, or mostly all in, or just do the right things in public and then do whatever you want the rest of the time. You're either all in or you're not. It's either real or it's fake. So how much has your faith cost you? How much are you focused on other people? And is your faith unshakable? Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for this incredible morning. Lord, we we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, God, fully. That we can we can know you accurately. God, you've given us your word. God, you have an incredible vision and a plan for all of creation. Lord, you're restoring all things back to the way that they are really intended to be. And in your incredible love and grace and mercy, God, you allow us to be a part of that. Lord, so I just pray that every one of us would see the kingdom of God is the gift that it really is. And Lord, I know you've been, you've been working, you've been highlighting some areas to us, maybe, that you're calling us to, to repent, God. And I just thank you that it's, it's because of your kindness that leads us to repentance, God. That you're leading us into something greater, into something better. I pray that you would Show us what it would really look like if we trusted you fully. God, give us a vision of that. Lord, I pray that we would not leave this place without taking some step of action, Lord, without talking to someone. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that your way is is so much greater than our own. Amen. Man, uh, Dylan was planning to wrap up the service, and you totally would have killed it, but I just couldn't let you off the stage without getting up here and just affirming how incredible that was. I mean, there's just something about, I mean, there's so much in that, man. I mean, dude, you, how many of y'all feel just your faith being stirred, you know, as he shares, as he shares from the scriptures, as he shares the stories, Bonhoeffer, his own stories, you feel just God stirring something in your soul. I mean, do you guys feel that this morning? And, uh, and then, you know, for him to say, yeah, I just, uh, I didn't really think I was a good communicator, you're like, for real, if you're not a good communicator, what are the rest of us, you know? Like, come on now. So can we just affirm, I mean, how many of y'all believe this man has a calling in ministry to lead, to make disciples? Come on, man. And, uh, man, I just, you know, one of the things I'm encouraged by is just the, uh, the, uh, 
just the level of, of vulnerability, man, that you just led us in. You know, it's, it feels risky. And uh, I, how many of y'all can attest? I know for me, I would rather not share my weaknesses with other people. I would rather not share, uh, you know, how many colonoscopies I have or have not had <laughs> on stage in front of 200 people, you know. Uh, but, uh, man, there's just something powerful about being real with other people. And I just want to—I just want to say—I appreciate that you led us in that, because your relationships will only go to the depth uh, at which you are vulnerable, and at which you you allow yourself to be known for real. And so, uh, if you're in a small group, or you just you have relationships with friends, or even your spouse, you're like, man, I feel like I've hit a ceiling on this relationship. Why am I not feeling as close to this person as as I feel like I should be able to? Well, maybe you've hit a ceiling on what you're willing to share with people. And uh, man, there's just I, there's such an incredible example in, in that. And so, man, can we just give them uh, another round of applause? That was so good. Thanks so much, man.